I'm Drew Stevenson, and this is a lecture for my statutory interpretation and regulation class on the case Gregory v. Ashcroft, a U.S. Supreme Court case from 1991, about um, the federal regulation of state governmental functions. And it's really about federal versus state tensions um, and maintaining the balance between the uh, federal government and state sovereignty. Now, when it comes to statutory interpretation, there's sort of two ways to look at this case just as a preview. Um, the problem in this case ultimately is that we have a federal statute and then a state constitutional provision about the ret mandatory retirement age for judges that is in conflict with a federal statute. So the court faces this kind of conundrum of how much weight to give to a state constitution versus a federal statute or law in a, in just an enactment of Congress. There's no question that the federal constitution would win over state constitution or probably that federal law would win over state law, but this is a little different and the stakes are a little bit higher in terms of maintaining the balance between the, uh, the federal government and the state governments. Um, the other thing that's confusing, I think, for students about this case is the court talks about it as if they're just doing judicial avoidance, constitutional avoidance, or applying the um, avoidance canon. But what they really do in practice um, is more of requiring a clear statement from Congress about something, and which is a little different and somewhat of a different canon. And that's what the case really came to stand for. So what the case seems to be doing when you read it, and then what this, how the Supreme Court has cited this case later on are not exactly the same. The other thing to keep in mind is that we have this body of law about preemption and express preemption and different types of implied preemption. And you may be wondering why wasn't this just treated as a preemption case? And I think it's because the stakes are so high. We're talking about a state constitutional provision instead of just a state law. And also that the constitutional provision specifically relates to the judicial branch. So there's a little bit of interbranch tension here um, going on between Congress versus state court judges. So having said all of that and kind of ruined the surprise, let's take a look um, very quickly at what happens in Gregory v. Ashcroft. So the federal statute under question here is the Age Discrimination and Employment Act or ADEA, a statute we encounter in one or two other cases in my case book. And this makes it unlawful for an employer to fire an individual over 40 just because of that person's age and really to discriminate against them in other ways as well. But for purposes of this case, we're talking about um, termination. Now the term employer is expressly defined in the statute to include states and political subdivisions of states. And that's really why this becomes so problematic is we can't just say, okay, we will leave state governments alone because Congress put right into the statute that it is actually supposed to apply to um, state governments as well. What this means in practice is state governments are not allowed to discriminate against employees who are over 40 or fire someone um, because they're too old um, either, just like regular um, private sector empl employers. The statute also then has sort of an exception by defining employee uh, and then saying it doesn't include a person elected to public office or any person chosen by an elected officer to be on that officer's personal staff or an appointee on the policymaking level or an immediate advisor with respect to the legal powers of the office. So in other words, Congress said this definitely applies to the states. And so from that standpoint, they were not avoiding the confrontation with the states, but then they created an exception for um, people in the state legislature and the governor and so forth. And then governor, let's say appointees. So let maybe in some states that might be a secretary of state or um, uh, uh, the secretary of the treasury for a state or the state's attorney general and so forth. Again, in some states, those are elected positions too. In other states, they're picked by the governor and um, 
And so Congress exempted those types of officials. In other words, um, uh, if the voters want to don't want to vote for uh, somebody in the state legislature anymore or for a governor because they think the person is too old, they're allowed to do that, right? That person doesn't have job protection um, uh, because of this. So the statute doesn't really cover uh, elected officials and policymaking officials. So, but then we get to the Missouri Constitution, and it imposes a mandatory retirement age of 70 on all the state's judges. And the Missouri state judges who are approaching 70 argued that the mandatory retirement provision in the state constitution violated the federal law that we've been talking about. And the, the court holds that now we have a problem, right? That the statute would upset the usual constitutional balance of federal and state powers. And therefore, if we're going to take the statute and, and apply it in that way, Congress has to make its intention to do so unmistakably clear in the language of the statute. And so what they, the court decides to do is we really don't want to go down this road of having this federal statute basically upend a state constitutional provision that was approved by the voters by referendum, basically. Um, and so the court instead decides to interpret the statute as just not applying to the state judges. And now I hope you can see that you could make a plausible argument that judges are uh, should fit under that exception for policy making level, but they're not elected and they're not really exactly appointed in the way that probably the Congress was thinking. So when it extended the act's substantive provisions to include states as employers, right? So they, that this was very deliberate by Congress. Then they redefined employee to exclude all elected and high ranking state officials, including those appointed to the policy making level. And the court says it's at least ambiguous whether a state judge is such an, uh, an appointee. Now, maybe judges don't really, aren't really policy makers or they don't make policy in exactly the same sense as people in the governor's office or the executive agencies in a state and the state legislators. But judges are in a position that requires the exercise of discretion, the Supreme Court says, concerning issues of public importance, right? There's obviously some policy involved in adjudication and jurisprudence. And so therefore, it might be said that judges are on the policy making level. The Supreme Court held that it would not attribute to Congress an unstated intent to intrude on traditional state authority in the exercise of its art of Section 5 Commerce Clause power. Um, and it applies a sort of a plain statement rule. Some, in some places it calls it plain statement. A lot of uh, the more common phrase is a clear statement rule here and in the face of statutory ambiguity. Now, the court also, by the way, doesn't think that this is a crazy rule, and which is a little bit ironic because um, if you think about the Supreme Court justices writing the opinion, they think it might actually have been rational for Missouri voters to choose to require all judges to step aside at age 70. And even though probably the court says most judges don't suffer significant deterioration at age 70 or even right after that, the court says people could reasonably conceive the, the basis for the classification to be true. And so they, there's a, they do have some lip service at least to the will of the voters in the state in the opinion. Now, here's a, a little bit about sort of the aftermath or the epilogue of this case. The court in this case, in Gregory v. Ashcroft, says they're applying constitutional avoidance, the canon. But subsequent Supreme Court decisions read this case, and, and most law professors, um, as standing for a more general canon that federal statutes will not be construed to upset the usual federal state balance or intrude on core aspects of state sovereignty without a really explicit or clear statement from Congress. And I hope you can see that these are somewhat different things, right? Instead of just, we're gonna interpret the statute so that there is no constitutional uh, question or we can save the constitutionality of, the, of this. And I understand why the court would see that as what they were doing. Um, what they ended up expressing was, 
if Congress is going to do this, we want them to spell it out and not leave us guessing about whether they want really would have wanted us to go down this road or not. Um, and and so it's it's possible, even if it's not probable, that you could fit judges under the exception in the statute. So the court decides to go ahead and do that. Why? Not just to avoid the constitutional question, but because Congress really didn't spell it out that they wanted a showdown with the states um, on this point. Okay, here's a review question to see if you've been paying attention. If a federal statute potentially encroaches on clear state laws or a state constitution, how should a court interpret the statute? A, the supremacy clause suggests that federal law should always cancel out state laws, or B, court should require a plain or clear statement in the statute itself that Congress intended to disrupt the federal state balance. Hopefully you know the answer. This was supposed to be um, an easy question. And if not, I'm not sure you were really paying attention and you should probably review the video. And that concludes our little discussion about Gregory v. Ashcroft.